Hello. The U.N. General Assembly has voted to suspend Russia from the U.N. Human Rights Council. 93 countries backed the suspension, with 24 opposed. 58 countries abstained. Russia is the second country to be removed from the Human Rights Council after Libya had its membership stripped in 2011. Let's go live to Krishna Salumi at the United Nations to talk us through uh, some of the numbers and the reaction that has been coming in. Yes, well, this was the latest attempt to isolate Russia on the international stage and hold them accountable for uh, the atrocities that have been unfolding in Ukraine. And the General Assembly succeeded in suspending Russia from the Human Rights Council, but perhaps not isolating them as much as Ukraine's backers would have liked. We had a vote uh, where the U.S. was calling, uh, calling out Russia, called for this vote, accusing them of war crimes, uh, saying it was hypocrisy for them to be on the Rights Council. Uh, Russia, for its part, described it as an attempt to destroy the human rights architecture at the United Nations. And we know they lobbied member states very hard before this vote. Uh, we've seen copies of correspondence where countries were warned that it would be considered uh, 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 an unfriendly gesture if they voted against Russia here. Uh, at the end of the day, 93 countries voted in favor of suspending Russia, 24 were against, 58 abstained. Uh, the United States hails that as a success in holding Russia accountable. Uh, Russia says it's going to quit anyways. They don't care anymore. They announced that they're quitting now. So uh, at the end of the day, Russia was removed from this council, uh, but again, perhaps not as isolated as Ukraine's backers would have liked. Okay, thank you so much. Kristen Salumi reporting from the United Nations. Ukraine is urging NATO members to step up weapons supplies quickly as it prepares for a Russian offensive in the east. Its foreign minister, Dmitry Kuleba, has been holding talks with NATO foreign ministers in Brussels. Local authorities in the eastern Luhansk region have urged all civilians to leave immediately. Either you help us now, and I'm speaking about days, not weeks, or your help will come too late. And uh, many people will die. Many civilians will lose their homes. Many villages will be destroyed, exactly because this help came too late. Weapons are like money. They, like, they love silence. And uh, I will not be in a position to go into details, but uh, let me put it this way. I have no doubts that Ukraine will have weapons necessary to fight. The question is the timeline. Well, the head of NATO says allies have agreed to strengthen support for Ukraine, including the delivery of a wide range of weapons. It follows a two-day meeting of NATO foreign ministers in Brussels. Allies are providing a wide range of different weapon systems, uh, both uh, uh, Soviet-era systems, but also modern uh, equipment. Uh, and uh, I think that this distinction between offensive and defensive is a bit strange because we speak about providing weapons to a country which is defending itself. Uh, and and self-defense is a right which is enshrined in the UN Charter. So uh, everything Ukraine does, with the support from NATO allies, is defensive. Well, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says Washington will not let anything stand in the way of sending more arms to Ukraine. We have been... Um individually as the United States and collectively as partners, more than 30 countries, providing uh, to Ukraine uh, the, the weapons and systems that we believe it can use most effectively and that it needs to push back against uh, Russian aggression. And we're not going to let anything stand in the way of getting Ukrainians what they need and what we believe can be effective. So. We're looking across the board right now, not only at what we've provided and continue to provide, uh, but whether there are additional uh, systems that would make a difference. Stefan has more from Brussels. 
Blinken makes clear the balancing act that the NATO countries have been uh, going through in the last couple of days. He gave some very detailed and also gruesome accounts of uh, alleged uh, war crimes and atrocities uh, committed in Ukraine, basically giving uh, a clear message that there was a, f a moral responsibility felt uh, by NATO to do more for Ukraine, to send more military support, but uh, cutting short of, of, of being short of actually sending troops to Ukraine and also sending planes to Ukraine, because that could be seen by Russia as getting uh, a clear involvement of NATO in the war uh, with Ukraine and could possibly uh, cause a war between Russia and NATO. So basically, the NATO countries have stepped up their efforts, but have not gone in a total shift, uh, aiding Ukraine with troops and planes. And that's why he had a long list of, of sanctions, of uh, the all kinds of measures that the United States is now imposing on Russia. Uh, and that has been, of course, this very delicate balancing act that we've seen here in Brussels in the last couple of days. Rescue workers in Ukraine are searching under the rubble of apartment blocks destroyed by Russian forces. It's feared people could still be trapped under the debris in Borodyanka, about 60 kilometers from the capital, Kyiv. Residents say they were threatened by Russian forces at gunpoint for trying to rescue survivors. Ukrainian troops regained control of the town a week ago. Well, residents of the nearby town of Bucha have spoken of the trauma they suffered under Russian bombardment. Many spent more than a month in basements or shelters to escape the fighting. People are now beginning to venture out to survey the damage and reunite with their families. And Ukrainian soldiers are checking for mines and other explosives. We were in the basement for 35 days. There was shelling all the time. Sometimes there was no water. Sometimes there was no food. There was no light all the time. There was no information. Phones didn't work. There were shots all the time. The children were cold. I hugged them all the time. I told them that everything would be fine and Ukrainian soldiers would come. I explained to them how to fall, how to run, how to defend. Ukrainian authorities are working to identify hundreds of bodies found in Bucha and other towns after Russian troops withdrew. Some of the bodies are in a mass grave near a church. The UN's humanitarian chief, Martin Griffiths, traveled to Bucha to visit a burial site. Ukraine has blamed the killings on Russian troops, allegations Moscow denies. Well, earlier, I spoke to the UN humanitarian chief, Martin Griffiths, and he described what he saw in Bucha. I had the unpleasant and awful privilege, as you say, going to Bucha today to see the worst of what people can do to people. And I, I was taken to a mass grave in the courtyard of a church. This is a grave where local people had brought apparently up to 280 bodies of dead people from around Bucha to this grave so that they could at least have somewhere where they could be provisionally buried. Um, and when we were there and we saw these bodies in these graves, and they're now being exhumed, brought out, for forensic examination to find out who killed these people. And, you know, one of the things that came to my mind, of course, was if you were a close relative of any of those 280 people, you would want a decent burial in this tragic circumstance. And we're still waiting for it. And we're still waiting for the results of an investigation investigation to see exactly who did these terrible things and who should be held accountable. My Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has of course called for an investigation. We think that's totally right. I'm glad that the local authorities are also launching their own. We need the truth and we need it urgently and we need the people of Bucha to have some kind of closure after these terrible incidents of the last weeks.